the Joe Rogan experience. You've done some like legitimate studies with uh, DMT. Right. Yeah. I mean, I work um, mainly kind of, I guess you could say, theoretically, uh, in that I do more quantitative and qualitative analyses of the DMT state uh, and try to understand, try to use the tools of neuroscience to try to understand um, how DMT elicits its, its effects. So uh, we can kind of get into, if you want, if you want sure. to go really deep, yeah, I can sure. give you a kind of a, a neuroscience lesson. Yeah, can please. Talk about. So, so, you know, if we want to understand DMT, we kind of have to start with the, the basic observation. Uh, you know, before you take DMT, um, you are experiencing a world, right? Whenever you're awake and conscious, you're experiencing a world, the normal waking world. This is the world that's kind of familiar to us. When you take DMT, that world is transformed. It disappears. It's obliterated and it's replaced with one that is um, altogether stranger, shall we say. Uh, and so, so what I want to do is kind of understand, first of all, how that happens, what's actually going on in the brain to cause that transition and why that happens. Um, and you can't do that unless you have a, a decent understanding of the normal waking world. So what is the normal waking world? It's a model. It's an interface generated by your brain. So you have this world-building machinery on the outer layer of your brain called the cortex, and this is generating your world all the time. Uh, all the features of the world that you're experiencing are represented within um, the cortex. Um, and that applies whether you are just normal waking life, it applies in dreaming, uh, it even applies in the psychedelic state. The world that you experience is, is always constructed as a model uh, by the brain. And so what that means is that psychedelics, what they're doing is they're, man they're perturbing the brain, they're manipulating the brain um, and altering that model. Now, for example, with, let's say, psilocybin from magic mushrooms, um, Psilocybin binds to this a receptor in the brain called the 5-HT2A receptor, which you're probably familiar with, this, this serotonin receptor. Mm -hmm. And so this is a, it's, uh, it's called an excitatory receptor. It stimulates these neurons, of which your cortex is constructed from, and makes them more excitable, makes them more likely uh, to fire and share information between uh, to other neurons. You get this kind of loosening up of the, the world model that your brain is constructing. So the walls start to breathe. Objects seem to kind of change their identity. Everything becomes more fluid and dynamic. And if you put someone into an MRI machine, for example, you can actually see that. In the normal waking state, you can see the neural activity. It, it's, it's dynamic, but it's, it's kind of organized and well orchestrated. You give someone psilocybin, let's say, or LSD, uh, and you start to see the activity becoming sort of more random and fluid. Uh, so you get this, this state of slightly increased disorder, as if the, 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 the kind of the tuning dial between order and disorder in the brain has been slightly nudged towards disorder. But then with DMT, something remarkable happens. In the, the early stages of the experience, you get this um, kind of quite chaotic state, suggesting that the brain is entering this more disordered um, state, but then it kind of collapses into this brand new order. So you go from the order of the normal waking world to this disordered state, and then vroom, you collapse into this completely different type of order. So the brain is effectively constructing an entirely different model of reality. It's no longer the normal waking world model, which acts as kind of an interface uh, with the environment, but it's constructing a, a completely different world model. Uh, when you say constructing, why mm. do you use that term? Why, why do you use the brain is constructing? Because you're, well, okay, so, so if you think about, you know, how does the brain interact with the, how do we interact with the environment using our senses, right? So light information comes through the eyes, uh, the retina, and it stimulates the, the very back of the brain. You have an area, oh, 
Oh, you brought slides. I brought slides. Here we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe the next one, Jamie, is a bit easier to see. There we go. So at the right at the back of the brain here, you have an area called V1, which is the primary visual cortex. That's your interface with the world. Um, sensory information comes and strikes. It activates patterns of neural activity in V1. But it's very, very messy. It's like lines and patches of color and, you know, lines moving in certain directions. It's a mess, right? It's very noisy. It's very messy. It's incredibly dynamic. It doesn't make any sense. And so what your brain does is it has another level above V1 um, that kind of has a bird's eye view and is looking for patterns uh, within this neural activity in this lowest level. So it's looking for saying, oh, those lines kind of could be a triangle or this could be a circle. It's trying to find patterns to try generate uh, order from this messy level in V1. Can I ask you this? How do we mm. know it does that? That's a good question. Um, well, there are a number of things. So the earliest evidence came from a uh, one of the earliest forms of evidence came from a guy called uh, Wilder Penfield. Are you familiar with? No. So Wilder Penfield, he was interested in um, um, treating uh, epilepsy. And he invented something called the Montreal procedure, where he would remove a part of the brain that was the focus of epileptiform activity. Uh, the idea being that it would kind of cure someone's epilepsy. But before he could do that, of course, he needed to make sure that he wasn't removing you know, important parts for someone's function. So what he would do is he would cut the top of their skull off <laughs> when they're still awake, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and kind of expose their brain. And then he would zap different parts of their brain and say, you know, what's happening? Oh, right? my God. <laughs> Can you imagine? Isn't it crazy that that's how we have to find <laughs> out what works? Mm. We have to, like, it's... The aliens probably look at us and go, oh, my God, you guys are still doing that? <laughs> yeah. Like... Nowadays, things have moved on a bit, right? I'm sure. But, but I mean, this is not that long ago, right? No, How long no. ago is this? 1950s. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not even 100 years. Right. So 100 exactly. years ago, they were literally taking your skull and turning it into a hat. They were Popping turn... the cap off Pop and cap just, off. Uh, okay, Yeah. let's see what this does. Exactly. They yeah. would zap it. And what he noticed is that when he would zap right at the back of the brain, so this is the, this primary visual cortex that's mm -hmm. receiving information from the environment, they would, this, his patients would say, oh, I see flashes of light. I see lines. I see colors. It was very simple kind of things. Mm -hmm. But then he would move forward um, to kind of higher levels that we know now are kind of high levels. And then they'd say, oh, I see triangles or I see an orange circle, things like this. Mm -hmm. Then he'd keep going higher and higher. And then they'd say, oh, I see people or I see cops and robbers. Uh, mm -hmm. And then right at the top, you reach an area called the hippocampus, which you may have heard of involved in memory. Mm -hmm. uh, and the hippocampus basically keeps an eye, it's a bird's eye view of the all of this world model your brain is constructing. And it's kind of following and looking for, you know, interesting or important patterns. Um, and when he stimulated that, um, his patients would actually report memories. They would say, oh, uh, I hear somebody talking to me. You know, this happened this morning when I was leaving the house. My mother was telling me something about, you know, you've got your coat on backwards or something like this. Um, so you have these levels of the cortex that go from very simple um, um, kind of very low level uh, visual data at the, at the bottom end. And then at the very top, you've got kind of higher order things such as, you know, faces or people. This is sitting at the top. Um, now, interesting, have you ever, when you are dreaming, right? So when you, let's think about dreaming for a second. It's quite instructive, I think. When you're dreaming, right, the brain is actually constructing the world in basically the same way as it does when you're awake. Dreams are kind of selective simulations of the waking world. The difference, of course, is that there's no sensory inputs. So if you scan someone's brain while they're having a dream, you'll see that this back of the brain, this primary visual cortex is kind of quiet. But the brain is kind of using what it's learned about building the world in the normal waking state to construct uh, the dream world. So the dream world is built, in exact, it's built from exactly the same stuff um, as the normal waking world. However, there's, there's interesting features. If you, in a dream, have you ever 
um, tried to use your cell phone? Or no. You, not, not many people have. Um, what about read a book in a dream? I don't think so. One, one thing I have learned to do is to, I think I saw it in a movie, if you knock on a door, you'll realize that you're in a dream. And this waking t- life? I don't remember what movie that- it was. But the, it was a, a guy who was instructing how to lucid dream. Mm. And that if you make a habit of walking through a doorway in your home, and every time you walk in a, through a doorway in your home, tap on the, door, do- the doorway, mm. knock on it with your hand. And say, "Am I awake?" Knock, 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 yeah. and then you'll get a, in a habit of doing that every time you go through a doorway. And if you go through a doorway in your dream, you'll do it. You'll say, "Am I awake?" And then as you go to knock, 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 you're like, "Oh shit, I'm dreaming." There we go. And then you realize, and if you don't give into astonishment, <laughs> you can maintain that <laughs> you can dream. Maintain that thing, right? Yeah. It's, that's the thing. It's like, "Oh my god, yeah. I'm dreaming. Yeah. I can't believe this." And then you wake up. Right? Yeah. You get too freaked out and you wake up. But if you don't. Do it. And I've only been able to do this a few times because I don't really knock. I did it for a while after the movie. Mm. I saw the movie. I tried yeah, it for yeah, a while. Yeah. And I did have a dream like that where I went through a doorway and I said, am I dreaming? And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm dreaming. And then I, I realized I was dreaming. And then I was like flying. I was doing a lot of weird mm-hmm. stuff. But then it went away. And then I stopped doing it. And, and I've always it. been like, why don't yeah. I practice lucid? I'm, I'm, I've always I've thought about it like a dozen times at mm. least. Like, why don't I just get a book on lucid dreaming and really try to attempt to learn the techniques, and and I never do. Yeah, it takes commitment. But now there's actually a simpler way of that kind of reality tests. Um, A simpler way now is to just get out your cell phone occasionally, open up the the calculator and do a a few calculations and just check everything's working, Mm -hmm. right? Or open up a book um, and, and try to read it. Because the thing about the dream world is... Again, just like the normal waking world, it's, it's, it's constructed over kind of levels of a hierarchy from the highest level models. So your brain can construct a high level model of a, uh, a cell phone quite mm-hmm. easily. But all of the fine details of how it functions, that's all represented at the lowest level of the cortex. That's really dependent on sensory inputs. So you can dream of having your mobile phone in your hand and doing th- with it. But as soon as you try to do something uh, with it, to actually your brain has to kind of construct that function and it, do- it can't do it unless mm. it has access to sensory inputs. And so that's how you can test if you're lucid dreaming. Okay. Yeah, and, and which is why the DMT state is so fascinating is because it's, it's nothing like the dream state. People say, um, you know, that, that perhaps DMT is released... Um, when you're dreaming and that it actually triggers. I mean, this this goes back to um, the 1980s. There's mm-hmm. a, 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 a theoretical paper published by a guy called Jace Calloway, and he said, oh, maybe DMT could be produced uh, during REM sleep because it's closely related to melatonin structurally, uh, both kind of tryptamine structures. Um, but when you analyze the the phenomenology, you know, the actual experience of DMT, it's nothing like dreaming. Dreaming is generally the brain making use of what it knows about how to construct the world in the waking state and doing so in the dream state. So that's why if you ask people, um, you know, many studies on dreaming have shown that people, when they dream, they dream about people. They dream about dogs and cats. Uh, they dream about, you know, the, the amount of time they spend talking on the telephone or watching TV is actually similar to what it is in waking life. Um, so dreaming is more like a selective simulation of the waking world. It's not that difficult to explain. Um, because your brain, from the moment you were born, your brain was learning to construct the world as a model of the environment. This, is, this world is the only world that your brain knows how to build or should know how to build. And yet when you introduce this molecule, dimethyltryptamine, into the brain, the brain suddenly starts constructing a world it never learned to construct. It's like the brain is build, uh, speaking a language it never learned to speak and doing so flawlessly. These worlds are of beautiful crystalline clarity, perfectly finessed, staggeringly complex narrative complexity um, that I think is very difficult 
to explain. There's no simple explanation of why the brain should, should, should suddenly become capable of constructing these worlds unless, unless and this is where things become more contentious, uh, we are indeed interfacing with some kind of intelligence. That's my that's the explanation that makes sense to me, is that somehow DMT is gating access to some kind of, the, the flow of information from some kind of intelligent agent that is directing um, the DMT experience.